Excellencies, members of parliaments, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a real uh, pleasure and honor for me as chair of the Israel Friendship Group in the Finnish Parliament uh, to have you here participating to our seminar today. United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181 is a historical achievement that we could be truly proud of. Five years ago, speaking at an event marking the 70th anniversary anniversary of the UN Resolution 181 on the partition of, the Pal of Palestine, World Jewish Congress Chairman Ronald Lauder said, we know who we are and we know where we came from. This is why we are called Jews, referring to Judea, the Jewish heartland on the West Bank. And Lauder continued, these historical facts cannot be changed by any new UNESCO resolutions or any others who try to deny our history. Dear friends, this, is, this statement is still the very truth today. Four legitimate international organizations had promised Israel its land in the 20th century. First, the British government in 1917 in the Balfour Declaration promising a Jewish national home in Palestine. Second, San Remo in April 1920, a conference of the principal allied powers agreeing how to divide three then undefined Ottoman territories in the Middle East. And these were Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia. Third, the League of Nations in 1922, which agreed upon the specific borders of Palestine. And fourth, the UN General Assembly on 29th of November, 1947, exactly 75 years ago today, in the resolution 181 on partition of Palestine for the Jewish and Arab states. However, the territory has been divided smaller each time. And thus the promises originally given to Jews have been broken. In 1922, 77% of the territory earlier promised to Israel was divided to Palestinian Arabs and Bedouins. Today, the country is called Jordan. Israel was left only 23% of the territory. In 1947, the UN proposed the further partition, or 23% left for Israel to Arabs and Jews. The Jewish leaders accepted the partitioning, but the Arab side announced that it does not accept the partitioning, but rather wants to take ownership of the whole ter territory. Actually, the Arabs refused to participate in the United Nations process run by the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine during 1947. But immediately after Israel's declaration of independence in 1948, the Arabs started a war of aggression against Israel, but lost it despite having a superior number of military troops. Dear friends, Jews have bought much of their land twice with plain money. Before World War I, the Jewish Rothschild banker family gave a big loan to the Turkish Sultan in whose, in whose possession the land then was. As a collateral for the loan was a land area to the Jews from their ancient homeland. But this loan was never repaid. The second time Jews bought land as single plots from private landowners with the funds of the Jewish National Fund, which was established in 1901. 
Many of the landowners lived in big cities of the Middle East, such as Beirut. Dear friends, we give a warm applause to uh, Member of Parliament, Antero Laukkanen, that arrived. <laughs> welcome, Antero, and also other members of Parliament. Warmly welcome. But dear friends, as you can see, Israel has bought its land with its blood in the War of Independence, which the neighboring states declared and started, as well as in many defensive wars after it. Israel has cleared a swampland, desolate of cultivation and inhabitation. In the land where there were only about 600,000 inhabitants in 1947, now lives a nation of over 9 million people, cultivations and fish ponds. And a large part of the Arabs who have lived in the land of Israel have moved to the territory after the Jewish settlers because the land has begun to thrive at the hands of the Jewish, Jewish immigrants and by this offering a higher standard of living than in the surrounding areas. The great immigration of the Arabs and the Jews has been documented in the UN documents and it is also mentioned in the correspondence between President, United States President Roosevelt and UK Prime Minister, Minister Churchill. Ladies and gentlemen, in 75 years, the Arab population is in Israel has doubled. And it is good to have in our mind that the Arabs have 21 states with capitals, natural resources, oil. Meanwhile, the Jews only have one state, only one single state, and the acreage of which is approximately 1% of that the Arab territories is. Israel offered peace to its Arabs neighbors, but instead they started an aggression against Israel in 1948. As a result of this war started by the Arabs, the Arab refugee problem was created and approximately 650,000 Arabs fled from Israel's territory. And then most of these refugees have been held until to this very day in refugee camps instead of being housed in Arab countries among their brethren. The, so the often repeated claim that Israel would have stolen the land from Arabs is completely without historical and ethical evidence. While the Jewish people did not receive all the land that had been promised to them by the international community in 1920, the United Nations reaffirmed the right to self-determination of the Jewish people in their historical homeland. So dear friends, the vote in the UN 1947 was the longest three minutes in the Jewish history. But the results were a fulfillment or of biblical prophecy that speaks of a time when the Jews would return to Israel. The message from our commemoration today is that the Jewish people said yes to peace and the two-state solution already in 1947 and have continued to do so for the last 75 years. It is now high time that also enemies of the Jewish state recognize that Israel is there to stay and come back to the negotiation table. On behalf of the Israel Friendship Group in the Finnish Parliament, I wish you all an interesting seminar. Thank you. And dear friends, uh, now I have the honor to invite Her Excellency and my dear friend Hagit Ben Jacob, the ambassador of Israel to the stage. The floor is yours. Excellencies, members of parliament, 
distinguished guests, Huvat Ustavat. On behalf of the State of Israel and the Embassy of Israel in Helsinki, it is my honor to greet you here today. Thank you to the Israeli Friendship Group in the Parliament and Member of Parliament Peter Ostman and to the Federation of Finland-Israel Associations and Mr. Risto Huvila for organizing this event which reminds us of important historical events and moreover of how far the Middle East has come in the past 75 years despite the challenges. The United Nations Resolution 181 on the Partition Plan of Palestine in order to establish two states was the end result of decades of diplomatic and political efforts to bring a solution to a growing problem. The Jewish leadership, while having to make concessions, found a compromise within the community and were courageous enough to accept the plan. In sharp contrast, the Arab states and the Arab residents rejected United Nations recommendations out of hand. Decades of unrest has followed. Even though the General Assembly resolution did not succeed in its original goal, it has three important elements that retain their relevance today. Firstly, the Resolution 181 constitutes recognition by the international community that a Jewish people deserves their own state, a Jewish state, in their historical homeland. Secondly, the resolution called for the establishment of two states for two peoples, Jewish and Arab, between the Mediterranean and the Jordanian River, each fulfilling the national aspirations of its respective populations. However, the Arabs of the British Mandate Territory refused to accept the state because it meant compromising. Thirdly, the refusal by the Arab population of the Mandate Territory to accept resolution 181 demonstrated that they were not interested in establishing their own state if it meant allowing the existence of a Jewish state. This opposition to acknowledging the right of a Jewish state to exist in the Middle East lies at the core of the conflict. Even today, the Palestinian leadership rejects calls to recognize Israel as the Jewish state, a refusal that will prevent any resolution to the conflict. Going back to 1947, the Jewish people made compromises and succeeded in building a state that clearly demonstrates the power of a democracy. But this state building started well before 1947. In fact, all the core components were already in place. For years, the local Jewish community had not only cultivated land, much of which had been deemed barren and infertile, it had also cultivated institutions and infrastructure that laid the foundation for a democracy. These Jewish pioneers did not come with weapons. They came with different means. I, crow, I quote Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver, a Jewish agency chief representative in the General Assembly's special session on the 8th of May of 1947. The task was enormous untrained hands, inadequate means, overwhelming difficulties. The land was stripped and poor, neglected through the centuries, and the building took place between two disastrous world wars, even <coughs> when European Jewry was shattered and impoverished. Nevertheless, the record of pioneering achievement of the Jewish people in Palestine has received the acclaim of the entire world. And what was built there with social vision and high human idealism has proved a blessing, we believe, not only to the Jews of Palestine, but to the Arabs and to other non-Jewish communities as well. 75 years of countless challenges and peace agreements later we, later, we have, however, made significant progress with our neighbors, manifested in the Abraham Accords. This is landmark, this landmark, a concrete milestone in our relations. It is not just a symbol that will bring more peace and prosperity to the region, but hopefully inspire more similar cooperation by proving, <clears throat> by proving the relationship's immense potential that is mutually beneficial. As Mr. David Ben-Gurion, 
who proceeded to become the first Prime Minister of Israel, remarked to the same United Nations special session on the 12th of May, 1947. We have no conflict with the Arab people. On the contrary, it is our deep conviction that historically, the interests and aspirations of the Jewish and Arab peoples are compatible and complementary. What we are doing in our country, in Palestine, is reclaiming the land, increasing the yield of the soil, developing modern agriculture and industry, science and art, raising the dignity of labor, ensuring women's status of equality, increasing men's over nature, and working out a new civilization based on human equality, freedom, and cooperation in a world which we believe is a necessary and beneficial for our Arab neighbors as for ourselves. I hope that we will be able to see more changes soon, and then we do not have to wait another 75 years for a milestone of this magnitude or for peace with the Palestinians. The citizens of Israel today are proud of their country, which in few months will celebrate 75 years of independence, and they believe in the righteousness of its cause. Israel's innovative ability and technological powers are well known all around the globe. With its strong democracy, Israel will be able to face all the challenges that still await us. Happy 75th birthday, Israel. Thank you very much, Kitos. Uh, the next speaker represents the best friend and ally of Israel. Without decade-long efforts and support of the United States and uh, the leaders, Israel would have been in real trouble, not only in the UN, but in other arenas as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador of the United States of America, His Excellency Douglas T. Hickey. Well, thank you. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for being here. And first, um, I'd like to thank you, Peter, for, um, for putting this event together. Uh, it's very important, and the timing couldn't be more important, so thank you very much. And Maristo, thank you for all you do every day for this, uh, this amazing cause. So, uh, so th thank you both for uh, having me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, I am uh, delighted to be with you here today just to say a few words as we commemorate the passage of Resolution 181 just 75 years ago, which really paved the way for the creation of the State of Israel. We heard from the ambassador on the character of the State of Israel and ma what makes Israel what it is today. And thank you, Hagit, for, uh, for your words today, and thank you for your leadership here in, uh, in Finland. We, we truly appreciate it. I'm here to talk about the longstanding and unbreakable alliance that the United States of America has with the State of Israel. The relationship between the United States and Israel goes back to the 1947 UN resolution and to the very beginning of Israel's existence as a state. Uh, as many of you probably know, President Truman was the first world leader to recognize uh, Israel. A mere 11 minutes after the creation on November 14, 1948. Where, when explaining his decision to recognize the state of Israel, President Truman said, and I quote, I believe it has a glorious future before it, not just as another sovereign nation, but as an embodiment of the great ideas of our civilization. That couldn't be more appropriate or true today. Since that time, our two nations have stood side by side as partners. Our partnership is based on shared values and an unwavering commitment to democracy and the rule of law. And as many of you know, President Biden visited Israel just recently. And in fact, President Herzog awarded President Biden the Israeli Presidential Medal of Honor earlier this summer in Jerusalem 
in recognition of President Biden's longstanding and consistent support of Israel during his years in government, not just in the Senate, but as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, as vice president, and now as president of the United States. But the enduring relationship between our two countries is largely due to the deep affinity and enduring connection of the people of our two countries, irrespective of who's leading our respective countries. We have always said that Israel is a great partner to the United States, and Israel has no greater friend in the world than the United States. When we hear voices around the world veer from criticizing an Israeli policy to an, an unjust denial of Israel's right to exist, the United States stands up and forcibly and proudly in defense of Israel. The United States will continue to combat all efforts to boycott or delegitimize Israel. We will not allow Israel to be unfairly signaled out in any international forum. Unusually when people, or usually when people think about the U.S.-Israeli relationship, they think about the United States' commitment to Israel's security. That security commitment is ironclad. And it's underscored in recent years with the $38 billion memorandum of understanding that was signed in 2016 by President Obama. The memo of understanding is the largest single pledge of U.S. military assistance in our history. In addition, this past year, our Congress approved an additional $1 billion for Israel's Iron Dome defense system. That made 2022 the largest single year of military assistance that Israel has ever received. Our staunch support maintains Israeli's military edge, which is consistent with U.S. law, and we are dedicated to preserving and strengthening Israel's capability to deter its enemies and to defend itself by itself. Our security commitment to Israel has been and will continue to be rock solid. But our relationships go much beyond our security commitment. It includes extensive cooperation on a number of geostrategic challenges we all face today, such as climate change, food security, and health care. We also collaborate in critical areas such as science and technology, as well as intelligence sharing, weapons de uh, development to further our security uh, commitment to Israel. And on the education front, the U.S. and Israel, Israeli governments have supported more than 3,400 American and Israeli students and scholars through the Fulbright pro Program, the United States government's flagship international exchange program. The Fulbright program has promoted joint research and scholarship between Americans and Israelis that has helped build lasting connections and increase knowledge sharing, not just between our two countries, but around the world. The United States and Israel also enjoy strong economic and commercial ties. Our annual bilateral trade is $50 billion in goods and services. And we work closely not only to counter a range of regional threats, but also depend, uh, defend fundamental values and underwrite global security, prosperity, and freedom. And not just for us, our two countries, but really for the world. And as I previously said, the United States' commitment to Israel is steadfast and bipartisan. It transcends political parties and individual leaders. Not only was the United States the first to recognize the state of Israel, but during President Trump's administration, we were also the first to recognize the, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel in 2017. Another example of our continued support includes the Abraham Accords that were talked about earlier, which were signed in 2020 at the White House which normalize relationships between Israel, Bahrain, and the United Emirates Republic. 
making the entire region safer. The United States continues to support the expansion and deepening relationships between Israel, Arab, and Muslim countries under the Abraham Accords. It benefits all. Those relationships help further Israel's integration in the broader region in a historically difficult neighborhood in which Israel has had to exist. We will continue building upon the Abraham Accords as we did this spring with the landmark establishment of the Negev Forum to include cooperation with not only Israel, Bahrain, Egypt, Morocco, and the United Arab Emirates. Israel's peace with its neighbor is a shared goal of not just Israel and the United States, but should be a shared goal for all. As we work towards greater integration, the United States will also continue to work towards lasting negotiated peace between the state of Israel and the Palestinian people. The United States supports a two-state solution that will advance toward a reality in which Israelis and Palestinians alike can enjoy equal measures of security, freedom, and prosperity. The roots of the establishment of both the United States and Israel really lie in the resilience of the people who overcame challenges and obstacles to find freedoms in their respective lands. And our shared values and continued robust ties are what make the U.S. and Israeli alliance unbreakable. And as President Biden said this summer in Jerusalem, the United States was the first to recognize Israel, and we will continue to be the last country in the world to ever walk away from Israel. Thank you. Tito. Thank you, Ambassador Hickey. It's uh, really an honor to have you here and to listen to your speech about your long-standing friendship with Israel. The third ambassador with us today represents Guatemala, a bit smaller, but probably the second best friend of Israel. All, although I, as, a, as a Finn, I would like to say, of course, that we are best friends also with Israel. But I think we have something to do before we will reach the, the, that position. Uh, Guatemala, Mother Embassy, back to Jerusalem uh, to, on the 16th of May, 2018, only two days after the United States had done it. That was quite rapidly decision making. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador of Guatemala, George de la Roche. Honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening. As my new friend Peter said, I'm George de la Roche, Ambassador of Guatemala, based in Stockholm covering Finland, Denmark, Norway, and the Baltic countries. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, Mr. Peter Osman um, for inviting me to this seminar, uh, as well as to my also new friend, Christo Uvila, um, and of course, my honorary consul here, Mr. Peter Didrikson, sitting here in front, uh, for this very kind invitation. Um, Guatemala and Israel have historically had an excellent relationship this excellent relation has existed ever since Guatemala supported the creation of the State of Israel. The relationship between both countries has been characterized by extraordinarily good dialogue and by Israeli cooperation provided to Guatemala, including technical cooperation. The strengthening of the Guatemala-Israel relationship <clears throat> in recent in friendship and cooperation is also reflected by the increase in official visits made in recent years, and for example, in the signing of more than 40, 40 friendship and brother, brotherhood agreements between local and state authorities of both countries. It should also be noted that Guatemala now has strengthened a strengthened presence in Israel. There is a Guatemala street, a Guatemala school, the Guatemala garden in Emek Refaim Park, in Jerusalem, and of course, a Jorge Garcia Granados Street. Bilateral and multilateral relations between the two countries have also been strengthened, 
with very good prospects for deepening in the economic and tourism spheres, particularly in trade and investment. So, in general, the Guatemala-Israel bilateral relation is in all areas and can be described as excellent. By the way, formal diplomatic relations between Guatemala and Israel began on the 15th of May, 1948. Dear friends, allow me to share some history with you. Guatemala, through its then ambassador to the United Nations, Jorge Garcia Granados, may he rest in peace, was the second country after the United States to cast its vote in favor of the creation of the State of Israel, allowing for the formal recognition of Israel as an, in, as an independent state, and the first country in Latin America to do so. So Guatemala was proudly one of the 33 nations that voted in favor of the creation of a Jewish state on November 29, 1947, Resolution 181. Ambassador Jorge, Jorge Garcia Granados thus contributed immensely to uniting the Republic of Guatemala with the State of Israel, remembering that with his action, Guatemala gave the second vote for that nation to be formed. Not only that, but Ambassador Garcia Granados was extremely active and additionally successfully lobbied other colleagues of his at the UN to do the same. <clears throat> By the way, our diplomatic academy of my Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Guatemala was recently baptized with his name as a posthumous tribute to that distinguished Guatemalan diplomat who has been called the worthy notable of the 20th century by my current foreign minister, Ambassador Mario Bucaro, who by the way was our ambassador to Israel previously. Ambassador Garcia Granados' daughter-in-law, Stella Riger de Garcia Granados, was my first boss when I started uh, in this career as a young diplomat 26 years ago in Warsaw. She had previously served as ambassador in Israel. Some other interesting facts that highlight this special relationship are, for example, that in 20, 2018, Guatemala was, again, the first Latin American country to return its embassy to Jerusalem. May 16th of this year marked four years since we returned our embassy to Jerusalem. Guatemala is also the, the only country in the world that has, by law, since 2018, a Guatemala-Israel National Friendship Day, in which has a Guatemala-Israel Parliamentary Friendship League made up of more than half of our deputies in our Congress. Our Congress approved Decree 12-2018, which became law and is known as the National Day of Friendship between the Republic of Guatemala and the State of Israel. It commemorates the establishment of the friendly relations between the people of Israel and the people of Guatemala each May 14th. In the Israeli Knesset, of course, there's also a Guatemala-Israeli Friendship League. Next year will be, the, will be 75 years since the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Guatemala. And not coincidentally, the State of Israel will also celebrate 75 years of its creation. Israel will be the first country to, de to donate anti-COVID vaccines to Guatemala, <clears throat> with which the vaccination of health personnel began a very symbolic donation and support. The Israeli Agency for Cooperation, Development Cooperation continued to support Guatemala with virtual training despite the health COVID crisis. Support from Israel on agriculture and irrigation issues continues with the arrival recently for a two-year mission of an Israeli expert based in Guatemala, the only one who represents is Israel in all of Central America. He provides advice and training in coordination with our Ministry of Agriculture with the value support of the Israeli Agency for Development Cooperation, Mashav. Trade relations between Guatemala and Israel are also very good, and the interest of Israeli businessmen in Guatemala is on the rise. We bet on investments and on the increase in trade and tourism. A bilateral chamber of commerce and tourism called ISRACAM was recently established in Guatemala. We also have enforced an agreement for the reciprocal promotion and protection of investments whose objective is to intensify economic cooperation for the mutual benefit of both countries and with the intention of creating favorable conditions for the investment in either country, encourage individual entrepreneurship in both states. Recently, the Israel-Guatemala Free Trade Agreement, FDA, was signed with the aim of strengthening even more our economic relations, improving the competitiveness of companies from both countries, promoting economic development, reducing tariffs, eliminating trade and commercial barriers. Dear friends, 
Having been Director General of Bilateral Relations at my ministry, I can attest that Guatemala has, very, has three very, very special relationships. That is, of course, the United States, of course, Israel, and Taiwan. These, these three relationships we, we, we treat with, with extreme uh, uh, care and, 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 and yeah, care. Um, as DG, I was honored with planning and accompanying our president and his delegation on an official visit to Israel. And besides meeting Israeli officials of the highest rank, lunch with the prime minister was delicious, and also seeing firsthand the beauties and technological wonders of that great state and nation. Excellencies, honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I thank you very much for the attention you have privileged me with today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Della Roche. The Federation of Finland Israel Associations, and he is also the author of who has written a book, The Miracle of Israel and President Truman. Risto Huvila, the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Israel. It's an honor for me to speak here today and share about my decade-long research on the 33rd U.S. President, Harry S. Truman. Much of my findings were documented in my book, The Miracle of Israel and President Truman, which was published in 2018. And today I try to summarize certain key events and actions of President Truman related to the political process that preceded the UN Resolution 181 exactly 75 years ago today. Um, I want to present you the political situation of the world at that time and even before we, we came into, into the a moment of, of this event at the United Nations. So uh, you can see uh, green is, is positive approach for, for the Jewish people. Red is, is negative and as we understand that, that black is really hostile and deadly. So that was the situation how, how the Zionism developed uh, since um, 1850, around that time. And when we come to, to the year 1945, which was the uh, end of the Second World War, we can see that there were some changes uh, in leadership uh, in the United States, in Great Britain, um, and of course in, in, in Germany. And uh, what we can see that um, while President Roosevelt um, was uh, successful in, in leading the war. So basically, he didn't pay that much attention to saving the Jews. His idea um, to save the Jews was the saving the Jews through victory. So first winning the war and then the Jews would be saved. Unfortunately, that strategy didn't uh, work. Suddenly, there was a new man coming on his way to White House that hardly anybody knew. That was Harry S. Truman, who started um, a local politician in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, through different uh, phases of his career, he ended up in the White House, but that um, route was not that easy. As I study Harry Truman papers, I found a very interesting uh, diary. So he wrote it down every June, the day uh, 28th of June, starting from 1920. And you can see here different um, 
situations in, in, in his life. In 1920, he had returned from, from the World War I, and uh, he had a happy year. Next year was still going very well, and then he was broke and in a bad way. He made bankruptcy with his um, clothing shop for men, and somebody came to him and said that as, as you have now failed in business, why don't you try politics? And he did. And, and from that point on, so there were uh, new positions in, in local uh, politics, and uh, then actually Roosevelt named him an employment director for for state of Missouri in 1933. And already next year he was running for, for the Senate. And uh, so that was the rise of Harry Truman into a national level of, of politics in the United States. Um, Roosevelt and Harry Truman was photographed only a very few times. And uh, Harry Truman ran, ran for vice presidency, and, and he, he, he won the, the primaries, and uh, Roosevelt was running for his fourth term, and basically uh, they started uh, their term in, in January 20th, 1945. In just um, 82 days, Roosevelt suddenly dies. And Harry Truman, who never thought he wanted to become president, finds himself in the Oval Office. And that was a shock, not only for the Americans, but, but for Harry Truman, because he, he really didn't want to become president. A funny thing, not, not that funny, but a bit strange thing was that uh, while he was vice president during those 82 days, Harry Truman and President Roosevelt met only twice in official matters. And Harry Truman was outside everything important in the White House and, and the US administration. And where, when Harry Truman finds himself in the Oval Office, so there are piles of papers, memoranda, and, and, and uh, correspondence, and briefings, so he's about to die under that, that material. But so, he finds Roosevelt's legacy related to Israel a bit disturbing. So he understood that uh, Roosevelt and the State Department had given pledges and promises, especially for Saudi Arabia, in order to guarantee the, the availability of oil, which has been a critical element in, in the Second World War. Also, Harry Truman finds that Roosevelt had given very controversial promises both to Jews and Arabs and also to the King Saud, the King of Saudi Arabia, related to the future of Palestine. And uh, actually, President Truman finds out that his predecessor already uh, two years ago in 1933 in Bermuda, he had agreed with the British uh, Prime Minister Churchill on the restriction of the Jewish immigration to Palestine. And when Harry Truman learns about these things, he also finds a letter from President Roosevelt to King Saud in April 5, 1945, just one week before uh, President Roosevelt dies. And the, the promise of, of President Roosevelt was the following. 
Your Majesty will recall that on previous occasions I communicated to you the attitude of the American government toward Palestine and made clear our desire that no decision will be no decision be taken with respect to the basic situation in that country without full consultation with both Arabs and Jews. I would take no action in my capacity as chief of the executive branch of this government, which might prove hostile to the Arab people. So, a promise to, to discuss the things with both Arabs and Jews may sound balanced, but of course, everybody knew in the government that uh, it wasn't balanced. The Saudi position about uh, the Jewish people it, at that time was the following, quoting King Ibn Saud. If America should choose in favor of the Jews who are accursed, accursed in the Quran as enemies of the Muslims until the end of the world, it will indicate to us that America has repudiated her friendship with us. Very clear. Truman writes back, I am at a loss to understand why your majesty seems to feel that this statement was in contradiction to previous promises of statements made by this government. And until that moment, Truman many times, loudly, publicly, had said that we need to open Palestine for the Jewish refugees from the death camps. And that uh, reaction from King Saud was to this message. And uh, Truman continues, I do not consider that my urging of the admittance of a considerable number of displaced Jews into Palestine or my statement with regard to the solution of the problem of Palestine in any sense represent an action hostile to the Arab people. So the situation was very tense during those years and of course after that also. Truman receives a report from the liberated camps in Europe in August uh, 45. And he reads the following. As matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. They are in concentration camps in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. One is led to wonder whether the German people seeing this are not supposing that we are following or at, at least condoning Nazi policy. At that time, there were about 300,000 Jews survived uh, from Holocaust. This Mr. Harrison also uh, made uh, interview, interviews. Uh, thousands and thousands of, of poor Jews were interviewed and uh, this is a report from, from those questions. With respect to possible places of resettlement for those who may be stateless or who do not wish to return to their homes, Palestine is definitely and preeminently the first choice. Many now have relatives there while others having experienced intolerance and persecution in their homelands for years feel that only in Palestine they will be welcomed and find peace and quiet and be given an opportunity to live and work. <clears throat> One of Truman's challenges was the State Department. And actually he hired the great general, George Marshall, his Secretary of State, without knowing his stance on Palestine and the Jewish issue. And basically he found 
an opponent in the Oval Office, which really created uh, quite interesting situations. I, I come to that in a minute. Basically, as you may remember on the first chart, um, there was a change of leadership in the Great Britain in 1945, almost simultaneously when Truman became president. So uh, Prime Minister Churchill lost his office and a new Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, came instead. And uh, many scholars, many researchers say that he was an anti-Semite. He closed the doors of Palestine. He ordered his troops to shoot the Jews that were entering the shores of Palestine. And Truman wanted to open the gates because he saw and he, he understood that all survivors wanted to get there, almost each of them. Um, the UK government uh, enters a crisis in the, in the beginning of, of 1947. They were not able to maintain peace in Palestine and they throw the future of Palestine into the United Nations. United Nations take a uh, step to create, as we already heard here, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine with 11 neutral countries. And uh, these countries were supposed to research, study, uh, interview people in Palestine, both sides, Jews and Arabs. Jews were eager to answer, tell their opinions, Arabs refused. And, and so basically they bring that report to, to the United Nations. When Truman uh, got that report that was given from the United Nations in, in September uh, 1947, so Truman understood that his lifelong vision about, the, about Israel and the Jewish people was about to come true. And that vision, Harry Truman had received already in his youth. He tells in his memoirs, and I'm quoting it in pretty much in my book, that by the age of uh, 12 years, he had read the Bible twice. And he was very excited about the end time prophecies that Jewish people would return into their ancient homeland in the end of the days. And now he understands that that momentum is in his hands. And he starts work to work, work on uh, towards that goal. The problem was that the whole State Department, including uh, Secretary of State, was against him. They wanted to uh, have uh, good terms with, with Saudi Arabia and oil. But Truman wanted to make a difference and and he worked hardly he worked hard to to make this happen i show you this the 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 uh, the map of of partition plan you can see the jewish state uh, as green or or blue and arab state orange and in the middle of arab state there is uh, city of jerusalem internationally administered city that was it, it was supposed to be corpus separatum. Jews accepted the proposal, Arabs didn't. But when it came to the, this day, 75 years ago, these were the countries that voted for in favor of partition and uh, within these, these um, red box, you can see countries that were against the formation of, of the Jewish state. And while I, I have studied and, and 
saw these uh, countries, I have questioned myself, how are these countries doing today? And you may answer the, the same question. Afghanistan, India, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Yemen, Greece, Turkey, Egypt, and Cuba. I think they all were on the wrong side of the history. Finally, uh, one of the closest advisors of President Truman, uh, White House Counsel Clark Clifford, wrote in his memoirs, his own reading of ancient history and the Bible made him a supporter of the idea of the Jewish homeland in Palestine, even when others who were sympathetic to the plight of the Jews were talking of sending them to places like Brazil. He didn't need to be convinced by Zionists. In fact, he had to work hard to avoid the appearance of yielding to Zionist pressure. I remember him talking once about the problems of displayed persons. Everyone else who's been dragged from his country has some place to go back to, he said, but Jews have no place to go. And the first United Nations Je Secretary General said the following, I think we can safely say that if there had been no Harry Truman, there wouldn't be, there would be no Israel today. Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear friends, I want to thank the ambassadors for giving great and interesting speeches, even as Mr. Huvela. Uh, and we are also grateful to the Federation of Finland Israel Association for co organizing and co hosting this event. 75 years after such a historical decision in the United Nations is really a reason to commemorate. Finland uh, has had long-standing friendship with Israel. Uh, we have had diplomatic relations now for over 72 years. And this sounds good. I'd like to quote what Golda Meir said. She, she said lots of things, usually good things, but this is very important message even today. When peace comes, we will perhaps uh, in time be able to, to forgive the Arabs for killing our sons. But it will be hard for us to forgive them for having forced us to kill their sons. Peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. <laughs>